In the book of Matthew, we're continuing in the book of Matthew. I'll just remind you, if you're new, Matthew is, is the most Jewish gospel written mainly for Jewish Christians. You'll see that theme throughout the book. Some interesting things there. But we're following Jesus. We're following Jesus. This is really, it's, it's sneaky because it's a group discipleship lesson, this whole series. Um, our heart is that we start some kind of discipleship groups in this church, but there's a lack of, of leaders to lead that right now. And God's working on people's hearts. He's going to send them. Some of you are already qualified and something's holding you back. Some of you think that you're, you're serving me or a pastor or a church. No, you're serving the kingdom. I had my wife change on the bulletin, but it's cut out. It said, uh, we need you. I said, don't say that anymore. We don't need anybody. It's the kingdom. It's not for us. Serving the kingdom. It comes through discipleship. And this is what this is all about. So we're following Jesus, and you're in a discipleship course whether you, whether you like it or not or whether you know it or not, and so am I. Five discourses. Jesus is, he finished the Sermon on the Mount now. That's where we're going to pick up today. Multitudes on the mountain. He's gaining a lot of attention Matthew 7, 28 says that the crowds were amazed at his teaching for he was teaching as one having authority and not as their scribes. When Jesus came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. So that's, that's what's going on. They're already amazed at him just from his teaching and that very word is what I used in my prayer. It's the exosia for authority. Basically there it just means strength and force. Jesus had something that the scribes didn't have. The teachers of the law. Now the scribes, they knew how to interpret scripture. They knew how to study or how to recite. They memorized all the verses. They had a lot of knowledge, but they lacked living in the power of God. So in other words, they were all talking no power. The kingdom of God is much different than that. Paul says to the Corinthians in, in chapter 4, verse 20, for the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk, it is living by God's power. Power, exousia. How do we live by God's power? Well, by faith, we would say. Well, what is faith really? I've studied faith as long as I've been in the faith. The idea of it, the concept of it, the definitions of it, the original languages of it. Probably one of my favorite things to study. Yet it's the thing that gets most misinterpreted by Christians. And that's where we're going to start today before we get into our main section of Scripture. We don't really have to wonder too much because Jesus shows us, just in this gospel alone, exactly what living by faith means. In a way, Judy Taylor just exemplified it, if you caught it, and by the end, you'll be able to tie that into it. Jesus was not merely talk. He lived in the power the authority. And Matthew ties into this sermon these accounts of Jesus displaying his power, walking in that power, proving his power. So after, after he comes down, we see this set of three radical healings, miracles. And I'll summarize to get to the main verse for context, and you can look at where I'm... Uh, Reading in Matthew 8, 
just starting in verse 1 where he goes down off the mountain. So I'm not going to read. I'm going to tell you about the, the healings. First, we have a leper. Now, these are radical. Now, think, think Jewish. As a reader, a leper was the dregs of society. I don't think we've ever seen, in America anyway, I've never seen a leper. They were pl- nasty, I mean nasty, it just makes me queasy thinking about it, but they, that's how they were treated like they were nasty. Outcast by society, unclean definitely to the Jews. You don't go near them, you don't touch them. But this leper, Jesus comes down, sees what, He believed that Jesus, this Jesus, had the authority and the power to heal him. And he says says something very profound. He says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus made him clean. Moving on to the next one. A Roman army commander, a non-Jew, he's asking Jesus to heal his paralyzed servant in another place place in another room a Gentile interceding for his servant and he believed that Jesus was so powerful that just a word and he would be healed he understood that authority third we have not a big deal for us a woman a woman Peter's mother-in-law, she does not actually ask to be healed, nor was it biblically by her faith that she was healed. The disciples, if you read the account in Luke, they asked Jesus, said, hey, she's sick, and Jesus heals this woman. So these displays of power were controversial. A leper, a Gentile, a Roman army commander, no less, and a woman. These displays of power Tied to faith are also challenging to our modern doctrines of miracles and healings. And the questions of why do some people get healed and some people don't? We all wonder these things. We talk about them. We come up with good reasons for them. But there's two things we see here. We'll start with the leper. We see Jesus' willingness and his authority. His willingness to heal and then his authority. There is only one of those that any of us can absolutely know for certain. It's the authority of God. It is the power of God. It's a 100% guarantee. It's an absolute. God always has the power to heal. The willingness is up to him. The willingness is up to him. We cannot manipulate the will of God or the willingness of God. So we trust in his authoritative power. Yet, at the same time, we accept his will. So it's both and, not either or. Both and, not either or. You have to accept this statement, and bear with me before you, you get up and leave. Just, just hear me out. You have to accept this reality. It is not always God's will to heal people. I'm going to say it again. It is not always God's will to heal people. The teaching has caused so much damage in the church. So much damage. And the Bible proves otherwise. So it's not always his will, but he always has the power. That's what the leper knew. He has the power to. But he's not always willing. And we have to be okay with that because it doesn't show weakness in our faith. Now, I have said before, and I like to say, although I've been misinterpreted in this, I like definitions, I like to say it's God's desire like he wants to see us all healed and whole because he loves us but if you define desire, it is a strong feeling. So in this case, it's a feeling of, yeah, I want, I want to see somebody made well. That's different than his will, which is the certainty to do something. 
So he may desire to, but his will, God's will, even it comes before his desire. It has to happen. Our purpose is to trust him always and that his purposes are always good for us. Whether we go to Job's boils or we go to Paul's thorn, Timothy's stomachache, all these. These are great men of faith, absolutely, but they still accepted God's will. They believed in his power and authority, didn't stop their faith, yet they still accepted God's will when the thorn wasn't removed or the boils weren't removed right when they wanted them to be. Please track with me. Let me give you an illustration. Good parents always desire that their kids are sickness-free, that they're pain-free, that they don't suffer. Good parents always desire to make their kids happy. When do you want your kids sad? No parent can say that unless you have some serious issues. So, It's, it's not always what you want for your kids, even though you love them. It's not always what's best at the time. Sometimes they have a lesson to learn. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes they have to learn something out of this little struggle they're going to go through. So we pray and trust that God can do anything, and then we pray for his perfect will to be done. Now, I, I have heard, I have not saying from you, but in Christianity in general, here's, here's how it goes, something like this well, we're not supposed to pray like that. We're not supposed to pray according to your will. But Jesus told us to pray like this. Ladies and gentlemen, the Lord's prayer is not far from this. He said, your will be done. Your will, no matter what, your will be done. Jesus instructs us and models this. When he's suffering in the garden, we'll get to it later. Nevertheless, your will be done. I'll accept it, but I I know you have the power to heal me, to deliver me from suffering, whatever it is. So we have to have this, it's it's a balanced view, right? Luke 22, 42, here it is. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Isn't it interesting that it sounds like the leper's prayer? Matthew 8, 2, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. It doesn't matter what health and wellness preachers say. Just forget it. Uh, Benny Hinn, I love him because he's up, he's up there and he's, he's, he's repented for what happened. He said, you know what? We went way overboard, guys. Doesn't negate what God did. He said, we took some things out of context. And he's still ministering and it's powerful. So, People are healed when God wills it, not us. We trust in his authority and power, even if we have to walk through storms, including pain, sickness, death, all the results of the fall. And that's why Matthew ties this to um, Isaiah 53.5. He's going to tie the cross to healing now. Let me give you a summary of this. At the cross, it was not only sin, it was the consequences of sin that Jesus took on. All, everything, that burden, he bore our iniquities. That includes uh, cancer, that includes disease, sorrows, pain. Every single thing that you go through in your life, it's a result of sin. Your Savior bore that on the cross. It was his to bear. That's what we're talking about. Well, here's the question that comes up. Well, then how come everyone's not healed? Why is everyone not healed all the time right now? It's for the same reason that people still sin. The work of redemption will be totally finished one day, and then all the consequences of sin will disappear. Sickness, death, lies, unforgiveness, all those things. Everything you can imagine. In the meantime, when his power operates on earth, we see these miracles. And God expresses his authority. And he comes to his kids who trust in his authority. And he says, yeah, watch this. 
This is a taste of heaven. That when a miracle happens, it's a taste of what heaven is going to be like. If it happened all the time, it wouldn't be a miracle. One day, it's a long, permanent miracle. It's, it, there are no more miracles, really. It's just we, we're just the way we're supposed to be. So that's what he's tying to here. But the focus is on his power. And the reason for that is the same reason we've had in the 21st century the celebrity preachers and all these great, these great movements that have drawn cl- crowds. Jesus came on. I'm, I'm going to work miracles, but I'm not going to be a celebrity preacher with a big following. Now, this is Jesus. In fact, we see him avoiding the crowds often. And the reason for that is he wanted followers, not crowds. He wanted followers, not crowds. Crowds need to see miracles all the time. Crowds are after whatever's trending. And when it dies down, they're done. Followers stick it out and are there no matter what. They're in for life. And that's where we're going. And that's the theme of the next section. It's basically, will you follow Jesus no matter what? No matter what? When the crowds fade, when the hype fades, are you still going to follow Jesus? And there we step into Matthew 8, 18. And I'll start reading there. Now, when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to depart to the other side of the sea. Then a scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples came to him and said, Lord, permit me to first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me. Allow the dead to bury their own dead. When he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being covered with waves. But Jesus was asleep. And they came to him, and they woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. He said to them, Why are you afraid, you men of little faith? He got up and he rebuked the winds and the sea and it became perfectly calm. The men were amazed and said, what kind of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Jesus takes this smaller band of disciples away from the crowds. He he did kind of a triage or a filter or whatever you call it. And he got the ones who he knew were going to get in there. He gives a command, go to the other side of the lake. It was an order. Pretty big lake. I I did the research. The Sea of Galilee, it's it's a lake. It's seven times the size of Spirit Lake. I did all the math. I'm so proud of myself. I used a calculator, though. Um, Spirit Lake is big to me. I was there yesterday at your kite flying event. I've never been there in all the time I've... Well, I've been missing out. That was awesome. And we walked on ice. It's pretty cool. You guys got it, man, we got it made here. Anyway, seven times the size of Spirit Lake. I think that was Okaboji, right? Um, eight miles across, 13 miles long. Probably would have taken a few hours. That's it. We're just talking a few hours. Three, four, I don't know. I didn't do that math. So he gives the command. Now they're on their way to the boat. And here comes the filtering. On their way, Jesus is interrupted by a scribe of all people. A scribe is a teacher of the law. I will follow you wherever you go. A bold declaration, but a great example of somebody who is amped up by the following and the hype, and they're not sincere. They have the wrong motives to follow Jesus into the boat, into what's next. Because when there's miracles, people get excited. How could you not? It's awesome. Brownsville, Azusa, Toronto, wherever it is. And you'll be like, well, you know, some of them, it doesn't matter. They, they're excited. They're, they're exciting. Asbury was exciting. I mean, whatever. It's revival. And you want to go there. I found myself, I want to go to Asbury and see what's going on. And 
God didn't allow me to do that. He said, stay right here. We should be excited about it. But the gospel and the whole Bible, for that matter, this isn't me. This isn't my opinion. The gospel tells us that we're not called to permanent excitement on this earth. We're not called to a big following. The scribe didn't understand where, I'll follow you wherever you go. He didn't understand where wherever you go meant. He wanted to follow the show. He didn't want to follow the Savior. And Jesus knew, people probably came to this all the time, yeah, yeah, I'll follow you. Where are you going next? What, you going to the big tent revival down the street next? What are we going to do? I'll, 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 I'll do whatever it takes. I mean, as long as you, I can be around you and in front of all these people. So he says, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. This doesn't mean that Jesus was homeless, actually. Jesus had places to sleep. He was itinerating. He had host homes. Yes, he lived a simple life without the attachment of material things. That's something we have to uh, work, strive towards as disciples of Christ. It really means he was always on the move. And he was always about the Father's business. So he's not getting settled with things. He lived a simple life. The scribe was looking for influence. The scribe was looking for power and all the things attached with being the latest, greatest teacher. He wanted to be around that teacher for that reason. And Jesus is basically saying, this isn't going to be what you think it is. It's not what you want. Jesus knows his heart, obviously. Because followers of Christ are promised to be hated, to be outcasted, to be thrown into persecution. And where Jesus is going for the scribe, someone like the scribe, somebody who needs approval to complete themselves all the time, and he needs to be around all the hype to feel important, they're not going to last very long when things get rough. Because remember where they're going, they're going to the cross. And then after that, the most, I mean, heavy persecution for the church. The scribe wouldn't be able to handle these words that Jesus says later in Matthew 10, 22, and you will be hated for my, by all for my name's sake, by all nations for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. He wouldn't be able to handle what the Gospel of John says in chapter 15, 18, yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. The scribe can't handle this. And for sure, this teacher of the law wouldn't be able to bear the burden of what another teacher of the law later on lived in, and that's the Apostle Paul, and that's Acts 9, 16. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So the first point or whatever is sincerity because our willingness to follow Jesus has to be genuine. It has to be sincere, meaning for the right motive. If it's not, we can't follow on to what's next. Next, uh, they're all, it's still on their way to the boat. The scribe is gone. Jesus calls another follower now, if you remember back with um, the fishermen, they're already, they're already called, and this is another calling. Jesus just keeps calling them deeper and deeper. So they're already following Jesus. Here it comes. Jesus calls another follower. Now, you don't see it here, but it's in Luke. You have to look in the other account, um, which also has another disciple responding. It's in Luke 9, 59. Then he said to another, follow me. So Jesus actually asked him to follow first, follow him deeper. And he's saying, let me go bury my dad first. I gotta go bury my dad. I can't, I'll, I'll come, but later, because we, and it doesn't, the, the, the text doesn't say if the dad actually was dead. Right. And the text doesn't say he's gonna die a year from now. And really, it doesn't matter to this, to the, the, the whole context of this. In Luke's account, there's another who comes and says, let me go say goodbye to my family. Now we're getting to the point 
We're getting to where this next point is, the attachment. In both Gospels, Jesus is answering the heart issue, why they can't follow into the boat and go deeper. So it's priority. Priority. They had the wrong priority. For a Jewish reader, what Jesus was saying would have been really harsh. Let the dead bury their own dead. Uh, funerals were important. I, I, it would be harsh today. I mean, if someone just passed away, I'm like, no, 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 you've got to come to church first. <laughs> like, no, you're crazy. Or if I told you, don't say goodbye to your family, just come. We're going to go follow Jesus. It was harsh. Family values, family obligations were taken seriously. I believe they are in America as well, even though at the core families are being destroyed. But we have this family, right, in a lot of cultures. We elevate it, blood relatives. But following Christ means we're willing to forsake our agendas, our plans, our our dream of the American dream, right? Your white picket fence, you're willing to forsake all that. Even commitments, even at times, not for everyone, blood, family, ties, relatives. Jesus hits pretty heavy on this. You can't ignore it. It's not like one, one obscure place. You might have to forsake your brothers and your sisters and, and, who is, and all that. So who is my brother? Who, even your need to say goodbye. We cherish goodbyes too. It's, a, it's an emotional thing. It's, yeah, I got to say goodbye. It's your last time here we got a closure and all that all that that holds us as humans that we care so much about Jesus say no follow me it's now there was no time for goodbye there was no time for funerals there's no time for one last hurrah right you know that the event's coming up so you the night before you're going to go all out you know what I mean or you know that this responsibility is coming, so you need one last. <laughs> you're you're going to quit smoking tomorrow, so today you're going to smoke two packs. You know, so that was me. I that was me. I used to smoke. So, um, Jesus said, "Let the let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God now, now." And then he says in Luke nine sixty two, here it is. No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. That's harsh. Yes, he just said fit for the kingdom of God. These disciples, these followers, let's call them Christians. In all cases, they had the wrong priorities. They were thinking, I'm going to wait until I'm ready and then I'm going to go. I'm going to do some things. i got to get in order. It reminds me of, of couples in, in marriage counseling. When I do premarital counseling especially, of course. We're going to get married when all our finances are perfect. <laughs> oh, oh, just get married. <laughs> You're burning with passion. Just get married. No, I'm using that verse from the Bible. So, you're never going to be financially ready. You may think you are, but guess what? What if the next recession could be next week? I don't know. Are we in it? I don't know. So um, both of them had such ties to relationships. We call it codependency nowadays. They could not wholly follow Jesus. And it's a big problem still today amongst believers. So many times it's a relationship. It's a family bond. that keeps us from following with our own hearts, our whole hearts, keeps us from being with the master, doing his work. Many times looking back turns us into pillars of salt. I, I think that makes sense. Not the good salt. Instead of following after freedom, past hurts, past pain, unforgiveness, bitterness, Grudges have to be left behind, not later when you feel ready, but now, if your heart's in the right place. 
He says, follow me. So we have to let go of some, anything that delays obedience. It's immediacy. It's immediacy. Jesus, these guys are done. They, we don't see that they didn't get in the boat. He he's goes on. Jesus gets into the boat. His disciples followed him. And behold, a great tempest. A great storm. The word for storm in the Greek is the seismos, right? Where we get, I think it's seismology or something for earthquakes, obviously, because it, it means earthquake, but we're talking about a shaking. This was a violent storm. I don't know how it works in lakes over there, but yes, lakes can have storms. Big lakes. It was loud. It was scary. Have you ever been in the ocean in a storm? Scary, especially when it's dark. Jesus is sleeping like a baby. He's taking a nap. He went from the, a powerful sermon to these three radical miracles. All the excitement, all the crowds. What a contrast. And that's, that's essentially the life of a disciple right there. You go from mountaintop to a shaking. You go from wow to whoa. Covered by waves, thinking it's over. We're going to die. So fearful, they're, they're waking Jesus up. If I'm riding with Billy Graham, I'm not going to go wake him up. I mean, he's, 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 he's a big, big time dude, right? Well, he's, he passed away, right? So... Um, I, if I was with the celebrity preacher, asking him to save them. And he says, why are you so afraid, you men of little faith? I don't know how he said it. I'd like to know. Why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid right now? Um, so number three is faith. And I hope we have a, good, a good, good, solid biblical understanding of it. And I know it's hard to change, guys. I have. I, I, it's hard. It's hard when you've been taught wrong for something. The, what, what faith really is. Number three is faith, and I guess they, by this point when they're afraid and they're ready to give up, they, they must have forgotten the Sermon on the Mountain, right? Because Jesus covered a lot. Go, go back and read it. He covered what it means. Remember, our, remember about not worrying and trusting God for provision and how we shouldn't worry. I guess they forgot it when they're in the boat. And it just happened maybe an hour or two ago, so don't feel bad when you forget this sermon two hours from now. <laughs> they also forgot about the miracles. He displayed how powerful he is. Leprosy, gone. Par par a paralyzed person, healed. And of course, the mother-in-law with the fever. So they, they forgot that uh, something else that's really important, they forgot those things. They forgot that who ordered them to get in the boat yeah. and go to the other side? Jesus. It was his command. Failing to be secure in his power, the circumstances made them desperate and reactive rather than hopeful and calm, even in the midst of a storm. They needed to learn this lesson because there were bigger storms coming for them. The other ones, they weren't ready. These guys were ready. Now they have the refinement of their faith, and this is where the rubber meets the road. <coughs> Following Jesus means we trust him to get us to whatever destination he wills. Whatever his plans are, we trust him. He does not direct us into storms that he will not help us get through. He doesn't tell you to go somewhere and then forsake you and leave you. If he leads you somewhere, he's going to take you there. So they're forming this memory now in this boat with this whole storm scenario. And 
He would remind them of this later in the end of this book when he says, I am with you always, even to the edge, end of the age. They're going to remember. Remember when we freaked out in the boat? Yeah, he's, and he's still with us even now. He's not, we can't see him anymore because of the Holy Spirit. You cannot fear the storms when the master of the storms is right there with you. Now, some of them, were, they were going through what we go through Oh my gosh, what is happening right now? We're going to die. This isn't what I signed up for. I don't know if it happened, but I'm picturing, because I've seen where the coast is, the scribe and the other follower of Jesus who didn't, get, didn't make it in, they're probably thinking, looking at the storm, ha, see, I'm glad I didn't go with him. You know? Like, I, I could be dead right now. Well, they're going to see him later on, and they're going to have a testimony, and maybe they'll reckon with that. Maybe that scribe was Paul. We don't know. I don't know. And then later on, it could, it could be. Um, they should have. They could have gotten in. And once you're in the boat, ladies and gentlemen, you have to trust the one who's with you. You have to trust him. It's not about your expectations. It's about the power and the authority of God. Getting in the boat does not guarantee a peaceful a peaceful ride just like it doesn't guarantee healing all the time it doesn't guarantee that you're going to be wealthy and loved by everyone have all the approval that you didn't get in high school for me anyway that's me I was an outcast in high school totally traumatic getting in the boat does not mean you're going to have a smooth ride it means you're riding with the one who has the power, the authority to get you through anything. Anything. It's his authority. It's his power. Getting in the boat means you're willing to leave it all behind. Family, friends, career, anything. Past, hurts, unforgiveness, bitterness, what they did to you in the past. Those things keep us from going all the way with Jesus. And Jesus is still speaking to believers. And he's saying, you're, you're, don't miss the boat. Now, getting in the boat implies that storms are going to come. It's going to happen. But the calmer of the storms is always with you. In one word, chaos by his power stops. Just by his one single word. With his word, stillness and peace replaces our darkness and fear because he has the power to do this. And the more time that we spend with him, the more we understand the power of his word. That's what I understand now. The more, and I have a long way to go, but the more I read his word and I remember all the times I felt so faithless, when I had to go through some stuff and I had people telling me, you just don't have enough faith, Nicholas. Where's your faith? Here, pray this prayer. Here, read this book. It was never about me in the first place. It was always about me trusting in the one who had the power to do all those things. That's what matters most of all. The more time you spend with him, you're gonna understand the power of his word. And I guarantee the next time, these disciples were a bit more trusting. The, storm, the next time when the storm came, I mean, this time they woke him up. Next time they would be napping with Jesus. Like, storm? They know they're going to get to the other side because he's done it before. He'll do it again. And they needed to rest because do you know what happened on the other side? On the other side, what was waiting for them and for Jesus? De demons. Demons from hell. Yeah. Demons that only the po power of Jesus Christ could have the ability to cast into swine. And here it is, out of the frying pan and into the fire. And that's discipleship, ladies and gentlemen. So if, if you want prosperity... God's all-powerful. Of course, he can do whatever he wants. If you want a cushy life, this is, this is never discipleship in here. 
Yes, there's miracles. Yeah, there's power. Yeah, there's all that stuff, but it's not ours. It's his. It's for his glory, and it's according to his will. So they're, they're on the other side now. And, and they're going to remember, well, he, he's still with us, even though there's like these demonic, crazy people coming at us now. And he's always with you. He's always with us. He's always with us. He's with you in the boat. He's with, whatever boat you're going through, you can use it for a lot of things. Isaiah 43, 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, wow, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. When I, when I, when I put that verse in, I was, I was only thinking of the fire. I didn't even see the water connection there. That's awesome. You know he's with you? If you're in the boat. But the ones who are ready to get into the boat are really the ones who go for, from this called to call, to call, to call, to chosen. That's, it's the call, to call, to, you're, you're calling, it's, it's going deeper, it's going deeper, it's going deeper to that chosen thing. And when you're chosen, you know who you are in Christ. Your identity is being made complete. And you realize, now you're not perfect, but no matter what happens, it's gonna be, he's gonna take care of me. It's gonna be okay. Yes, I pray, for, I pray with faith for healing and miracles and deliverance, but no matter what, his will be done, he's going to get me through because it's to accomplish his purposes. And we have to reckon with that and submit to that or you're not going to be ready for what's next because you'll be so disappointed when the storms come and it didn't turn out the way you wanted. Faith. Trusting in his power is what keeps us in the boat. That's what keeps you in the boat of discipleship, of Christianity, whatever you want to call it. Just to get in there, though, you need sincerity, and you need to have your priorities in order, or guess what? You're not qualified to enter in to a life of faith. And those are, those are things that are in our control for our will to submit to. Where are you this morning? As I close, Ani, would you just come play something? Great, up here. Hmm. Maybe you're a scribe, and they don't know if he was actually a follower. You know, they debate about those things, and I, I don't go there. I just go what the text says, so he's a scribe. Just call him a scribe. Say he wasn't really a follower. You're amped up, you expected something, and, and it's not your expectations, and if it's not your expectations, if God doesn't do this, I'm not going to buy into this whole Christianity thing. I mean, he's got to, I, I want everything to be great, <laughs> or <laughs> what I expect, what I, what I, what maybe that, that celebrity preacher told me, right? If it's not that, no, 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 no. Or, or maybe, I think the next one is the heaviest in this room this morning. Maybe you are a follower of Jesus. You've been walking, following after him, but you refuse to let go of the past. You're holding on. You got to bury your dad first. You got to say goodbye to family and friends. But that family and friends, they ain't your family and friends because it's, it's ties to the past in your life. It is hurts that you're carrying that have not been released. And you think that, well, God's got to heal me of that. No, 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 no. We're talking about a different kind of healing now. We're talking about the healing that takes place when you said, yeah, I'll let go. I'm coming with you right now. Boom, you're healed. Unforgiveness gone. Bitterness gone. He takes those things away because they're a hindrance to your soul. If you have migraines your whole life, that's different. We're talking about things in there that you're worshiping and it's taking away from where you're supposed to be in Jesus Christ. 
in this room today somebody's holding on and Jesus is saying I, you still time come on I'm not going to stand here forever what are you waiting for you wanted this Christian life you wanted to be with me forever you want me to show you how you can overcome and be used for my glory and that's why when you hold on to those things you're not going to be used for your calling you're calling you're calling you're calling you're calling you're calling Take your hand off the plow and get in the boat. Forget burying your family. That It's over. You have to move forward. You're running out of time. There, time is only for so long. Third person. You're in the boat. We're having a great time. And you are in such a storm right now. You are so afraid because of the unknown. Let me tell you this morning. He is with you. He is not abandoning you. He is not going to forsake you. You think he's going to leave you on the boat and let you die? No. He called you. He's going to follow through with whatever it is. So will you trust him this morning? Close your eyes. Please. I say that in humility. Jesus. Master, Lord of Lords, he chose today at 11.37, I think it's January 28th, I'm not sure, and I'm pretty sure it's 2024. He chose today, that stirring in your heart is not my, I'm not a celebrity preacher, so it's definitely not that. He is calling you deeper this morning, that's all this is, and you need to really make that commitment doesn't matter if you're a believer, doesn't matter if you're uh, already a believer or that you had confirmation or your baptism, just forget all those things. You're saying, you know what, I, I'm going to follow you this morning. I'm going to follow you. I want to stay in the boat, Lord. I'm tired of holding on to the past. I'm tired of the, every time I see this person, they feel like it's like a disease festering in me and the hatred boils up and I know that I'm called to like do something great for your kingdom, but I've been holding on. Lord, help me release it. He's going to take your hand as soon as you take the step forward and walk with him. For those of you in the boat and you're, you just want to stay, you don't want to give up yet. Your finances are a wreck. Everything, your life, it just feels like it's falling apart, waves crashing. Your master's right there with you this morning. This morning, if you just, you just want to follow him, I'm, I'm going I'm to I'm gonna dare you to do something bold. Just stand to your feet this morning. If you're saying, you know what, I'm done, I'm going to follow him now. I'm following him into my calling. I'm following him into the boat. I'm getting in. Or if I'm in, I'm staying in, even though things feel like, yeah. Come on. Unforgiveness. Let it go. This morning. He will take care of you, no matter what it is. He's more powerful than cancer, Tracy. I think you already know that. See, Tracy's in the boat. I haven't even seen him shaken. I mean, I've seen him go through the emotions, but he's proclaiming the gospel in the midst of it. Are you ready to do that in the storm this morning? I see like everybody standing up, so I guess we're in the boat. We're getting in the boat, and the master's with us. He's not going to leave you, folks. He loves you so much. He doesn't want to see us not follow him. It's our choice. Thank you, Lord. Just stretch your hands to heaven this morning. Now, this, this goes outside of my conversation with you because this is you and Jesus. Just cry out to him. I'm not going to give you a prayer. Just cry out to him from the depths of your heart. You don't have to cry out loud. You can do it. You can do it however you do it. He, you're a person that Jesus knows and loves. And just tell him this morning, Lord, I, I'm, I'm staying in the boat. We're going to get through this. Lord, I want to stay, God. Because you know for me, God, 
I've had waves crashing on me, God. And I'm, I know you're with me. You promised it. You called me to go where you said go, and you're going to go with me. Thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you, Lord, for commitments in here. I thank you for the shedding of the past the letting go of the past and the freedom that's coming for the ones that he's calling into ministry just now when they thought it was over. Just now he's going to start doing things in your life that you couldn't even imagine. People at your jobs are going to start noticing different things in you because you're walking in freedom and you're not the Christian that you were. Now you're a new Christian who lives their life in the boat with the master through storms in calm and peace in and out of healing in and out of expectations it's awesome out of the frying pan into the fire and back out again it's great it's exciting and he's calling you this morning missionaries workplace preachers gifts of prophecy gifts of healing gifts of all kinds of things he's willing to pour out Jesus has got a sack into that boat better than Santa Claus and he's given you all kinds of gifts because you got in and you're faithful you trust him nothing you earn it's because he loves you and now you know how loving he is thank you Lord father I pray right now in Jesus name thank you for teaching us by your word God Raise up leaders in this place, God. Call them, Father. Call them deeper, Lord. And we'll follow you wherever you may lead us. In your name, by your authority, trusting in your power. And Lord, we say, thy kingdom come. Your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good day. Stay in the boat. Your master's with you this morning. If you need prayer, 